You know, if we came up with a battery that didn't need metals, if we did, fantastic. I would be the first to celebrate that. But it's not feasible. Like, there's no way that's ever going to happen. Just imagine trillions of ancient nodules, small enough to fit in the palm of your hand, made of cobalt, magnesium, nickel, zinc, copper, and other rare minerals crucial to green technology littering the ocean floor. A clean energy sunken treasure waiting for a millennia beneath 18,000 feet of seawater to be harvested according to the rules of the International Seabed Authority, quote, for the good of all mankind. Hi everybody, I am Doug Barr and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the St. Helena Forum for Innovation and Creativity. As many of you know, we are an educational nonprofit with a mission to inform, entertain, and inspire by presenting conversations on a wide variety of humanities-based subjects. Should mining the ocean's depths proceed full speed ahead? And if it does, why is it likely to encounter stormy seas? Those are just the first of many questions dealing with the timely, important, and contentious subject of deep sea mining that we'll be discussing in our three-part series of interviews during World Ocean Week 2024. The International Energy Agency predicts that the total global stock of electric vehicles, if sustainable development policies are adopted, would reach 230 million by 2030. The minerals I mentioned embedded in the nodules found on the seabed are important components of electric vehicles, as well as smartphones and rechargeable batteries and touchscreens and solar cells and wind turbines and a whole host of others. The nodules of greatest mining interest sit on the sediment surface across abyssal plains in the clarion Clipperton zone. We're going to call it the CCZ. It's a region spanning 1.7 million square miles across the central Pacific Ocean from Hawaii all the way to Mexico. Currently, contracts for mining exploration in the CCZ have been granted to mining contractors with exploration areas covering approximately 400,000 square miles. The deep sea mining industry is developing specialized underwater mining technology to harvest these remote mineral resources, which will involve collecting the nodules at the seabed and then bringing them up to the surface to ships for transport to land. If we can successfully retrieve these crucial metals by mining the deep ocean rather than, say, track, hacking down rainforests and fostering child labor, potentially, in strip mines in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, isn't that something we should do? Our first guest, whom you'll meet in just a couple of minutes, is the CEO of the metals company, Gerard Barron, and I'm pretty certain his answer will be unequivocal, and it'll be yes. But here's the rub. Mining the nodules would involve scraping off the top layer of the ocean floor, separating the nodules from the mud, using a giant tube to pump them to the surface ship, and returning the water and the fine particles to the seabed through another tube, creating plumes of disturbed sediment that potentially spread over miles before resettling on the ocean floor. Evidence suggests that collecting these nodules is likely to result in the destruction of life, habitat, and ecosystems in the mined areas. Seabed nodules, which formed over millions of years, can't be replaced in any meaningful way, and scientists are just beginning to study the array of species that live in these depths, from sponges and sea anemones to shrimps and octopods. Very little is known about how far they range, how populations are connected, and what damage may be caused by the spread of sediment plumes and other effects of mining. Scientific monitoring of experimental uh, dredge sites in deep sea sediment has shown that decades after a site is disturbed, few if any communities of organisms have recovered. And due to a lack of historical research in the region, there's still a great deal to learn about what creatures are living in the CCZ. But recent efforts have actually led to the discovery of many new species, suggesting both high species richness and high species rarity. It appears that polymetallic nodules in the region, the target of much deep sea mining, are essential for fostering biodiversity on the seafloor. 
Simply put, we just don't yet know how much life and interconnectivity of species and environments will be lost forever if we proceed without taking the time to fully understand the long and short-term effects of deep sea mining. In our second interview with Dr. Lisa Levin, a distinguished professor of Scripps Institute of Oceanography and a marine ecologist who studies ecosystems in the deep sea and shallow water, we'll ask her to tell us what current science is revealing on the seafloor and the CCZ and what damage may result from deep sea mining. Two valid points of view, mine now, collect the minerals that will help slow fossil fuel damage to the environment, or wait to gather more data to understand and mitigate the risks of irreplaceable ecosystems destruction. And so who decides? Who decides which way we go? With no rules in place to govern undersea mining, the United Nations intervened and adopted the Convention on the Law of the Sea, a treaty that went into effect in 1994 and now has been ratified by 167 countries in the European Union. The agreement established the International Seabed Authority, granting it exclusive jurisdiction over mining in international waters and charging the ISA with the creation of a regulatory system. The ISA's mission, as laid out in 1967, suggests that the seabed be used, quote, for the exclusive benefit of mankind as a whole. It also says that, quote, mining should not cause serious impairment of the marine environment, end quote. Governing approximately half of the total area of the world's oceans, the International Seabed Authority is, quote, to exercise oversight and activities that might threaten biological diversity and harm the marine environment, end quote. The authority operates as an autonomous international organization with its own assembly and council and secretariat. Since the International Seabed Authority's inception in 1994, it's approved over two dozen ocean floor mining exploration contracts in the Atlantic Pacific and Indian Oceans, and the majority of the contracts for exploration are in the Clarion Clipperton zone. To date, the authority has not authorized any commercial mining contracts as it deliberates over regulations amid global calls for moratorium on deep sea mining, despite advocates for the deep sea mining industry continuing to argue that extraction of rare metals is critical for electric car batteries and necessary to develop a fossil fuel free economy. Scientists and environmentalists warn mining could wreak havoc on the seabed, a vital carbon sink and home to rare and diverse species. Environmentalists, scientists, 44 countries, Google, BMW, Volvo, the World Wildlife Fund, and several Pacific nations, including Fiji and Papua New Guinea, have requested a moratorium on deep sea mining until more scientific research is conducted on its impacts on the marine environment. James McFarland, Executive Vice President of Strategic Robotic Systems and former head of the Office of Resources Environmental Monitoring at the International Seabed Authority will be our third guest and help us decipher if and how the ISA is managing to fulfill its mandates. And now that we've finally defined the parameters of the conversation, I'm going to stop talking and we'll listen to what the experts have to say. All three of these interviews will be moderated by our friend Dave Freed. Dave Freed is a screenwriter, author, and former award-winning investigative journalist for the Los Angeles Times. He served as the Times' lead police reporter, shared in a Pulitzer Prize for the newspaper's coverage of the 1992 Los Angeles riots, and reported from Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Iraq during Operation Desert Storm. He has an extensive reporting background in law enforcement and military affairs. For a mining positive perspective, we'll hear from the CEO of the Vancouver-based The Metals Company, Gerard Barron. The Metals Company, formerly Deep Green Metals, is a Canadian deep sea mining exploration company focusing on the mining of polymetallic nodules. Mr. Barron is a seasoned entrepreneur with a track record of building global companies in battery technology, media, and future-oriented resource development, both as a chief executive officer and as a strategic investor. In 2001, Mr. Barron founded AdStream, a global advertising technology and service provider, and served as the company's CEO until 2013. During that time, AdStream grew from a single office in Sydney, Australia, to over 40 offices in 30 countries around the world and over 
hundred million dollars in global revenue per year. Mr. Barron became involved in the early strategic development and financing of Deep Green during its formation and stepped into the role of chairman and chief executive officer in 2018. And with that, if you're ready, Dave, I will turn the floor over to you and Mr. Gerard Barron. Doug, thank you very much. And Gerard, thank you so much for being with us today. This is a fascinating subject and, and a fairly complex one. Maybe a good place to start would be to help us understand the process. Um, walk us through how does one viably extract minerals from deep below the surface of the ocean uh, and bring them to market? How do you do that? Well, we're... We're familiar with land-based mining, where, of course, you know, hundreds of years ago, you know, ex explorers found these mineral deposits that were exposed, right? And so man went and took the obvious and easiest to get to ones first. But as time has gone on, we've had to go to, to harder and more fragile ecosystems on our planet, on land. And, of course, probably the most extreme a uh, case of that is what we're doing now to secure our supplies of nickel, which is where we we have to go and, uh, well, not we, but people are going to remove the rainforest because these nickel deposits lie in the soil underneath them. And there's an enormous amount of effort to do that because you have to build infrastructure, you have to build power and roads and water supplies and places for people to live and then pl things to do with all the waste you generate. And, you know, that becomes a really big, complex task. Whereas in the ocean, there are three types of metals. And, and at the metals company, we're focused on something known as polymetallic nodules, like the one in my hand here. And these literally lie on the ocean floor, like the one in my hand, unattached like golf balls on a driving range. And so, and they're fortunate that they're in a part of the ocean known as the abyssal plain. And it's the ecosystem on our planet with the least life. The only environment with less life is polar ice. So if you think about a scale of all of the different ecosystems on our planet, You've got tropical rainforests up here, which of course is where much mining is happening now, unfortunately. And at the other end of the scale, you've got the abyssal plains, and that's where these nodules lie. We measure the amount of life down there in grams per square meter. There's around 10 grams, and most of that is bacteria living in the sediment. And so the process of removing them is we send a robot down 4,000 meters, which an electric robot, connected to a, uh, a transport system, which is a vertical, what we call a riser. So we move along and we fire a jet of water at these nodules, which creates an inverse pressure, which means we, uh, we lift them as you would lift a golf ball off a driving range. And then we separate out the sediment, we leave that behind on the seafloor, and then we use water as the transport mechanism to get them to uh, the production vessel, which is 4,000 meters above. And then periodically we'll offload them to a transport vessel, which will then move the nodules to shore for processing. And one of the advantages, of course, is that we don't have to build any of that infrastructure where the resource is. We can then send the nodules to existing already built infrastructure on land wherever it makes most sense. We can send them to North America, we can send them to Europe, we can send them to parts of Asia or all the way down to Australia. But importantly, we can choose where to send them. We can make sure that we, we send them to places that already have deep water ports, that use the most attractive supply of power, hopefully renewable power or uh, perhaps even nuclear power. And so it puts a lot of choice back in our hands. So it's a unique resource for that reason. Jared, what are the what are the technical hurdles, the primary technical hurdles that the metals company faces, or in fact that any any entrepreneurial venture would face in extracting these nodules from the deep seabed? Well, <clears throat> engineers love a problem to solve, and you know we uh, we we approach the offshore challenges by uh, attracting a world leading. Uh, offshore engineering company called All Seas. They, for the last 37 years, have been 
uh, laying pipe in the deep ocean, servicing the oil and gas industry. And so they will either connect an oil well back to shore or they'll con lay infrastructure to allow the transportation of gas or oil between countries. So they've been operating 24-7, 365 days a year in that industry in the deep ocean. So they brought a lot of expertise to help and supplement our efforts when it came to designing and building a, uh, a system that can operate with great efficiency and, and importantly, great reliability in how we pick up these nodules off the ocean floor. And <clears throat> so I, I could look at, you know, every part of our business, whether it's the collection part, whether it's the logistics on how we get the nodules from the production vessel to the transport vessel, or, or finally, how we most efficiently turn these nodules into battery materials. And, and there are safe, proven ways that we can depend on to get started. But the great news is there are optimizations that will come the whole way. So for example, when we designed our offshore collector system, we made some assumptions about uh, what we call the cut depth. So when we put our robot on the seafloor, you know, how far will the track sink into the ocean floor? Because that, that has an impact on how much sediment you pick up and you have to process and spit out the back of the machine. What we found in our collector trials was that our cut depth was a lot less than we had anticipated. And, and that came down to great engineering. And, and as we move forward, you know, we know that there'll be continued improvements available to us. And of course, what that leads to is two things. One of them is lower impacts on the environment in which we're operating. So lower environmental impacts. So already they're small but we can make them smaller. And secondly, it will lead to greater efficiencies. And that comes down to the economics that help make this industry viable. And of course, that's an important aspect. You know, we operate in a for-profit environment where we're a NASDAQ listed company. And so we have to be able to show solid returns for our investors because they are the ones we rely on for capital. So the engineering challenges are all very manageable when it comes to this new industry. There are some other challenges that are a little bit more challenging. And of course, we'll get onto those during our talk as well. And we're, we're moving through that now as we get closer towards uh, production and permitting. Yeah, well, I, we, I would very much like to explore the, the, the ecological implications. But before we do that, um, so you you uh, you mentioned a moment ago about uh, uh, you use the word trials. I mean, where where actually does the process stand for your company right now? You're not actively harvesting nodules, correct? No, we are not. Today we have exploration licenses, and they they provide us the legal right to go out and conduct baseline studies to so we can study the environmental impacts to. Uh, gather data so we can define the resource. And so we have the right to do that. And those licenses are granted to us by a, a body set up by the United Nations called the International Seabed Authority. It's made up of 168 countries plus the European Union. So it's a very high um, oversight that we have from that organization. And what we're doing right now is preparing our application, which will be lodged later this year, and that will be an application to move from exploration into the exploitation phase. And so that's a, a work that's a coming together of the last 10 years of effort. I, I think the average time to permit a land-based um, mine is around 15 years. And, you know, we will be less than that. But when you think that we started working on this in 2011, here we are 2024 when our application will go in and, and you know, we're determined to make it a world-class application. It will be the first time that anyone has applied for an exploitation license over a resource that is defined as the common heritage of humankind. So it comes with a heavy responsibility and, and we're going to make sure that it's an absolute knockout. So re realistically then, if, if everything fell into place, when would you begin the, uh, the exploitation of these minerals? 2026. So coming and up. That's not far away. You know, that's the year after next. 
And so uh, it's not soon enough on the one hand, but when you think about all the things that we need to do between now and then, you know, it's just around the corner. Do you have any sense of the, the capital outlay that the company would incur to actually bring this process to fruition? We do. We do. We, um, we've guided the market previously and, and we've part of the, part of the purpose of the collector trials that we ran so successfully in 2022 was um, twofold. One was to really test the engineering solution that we're going to be moving into more production scale in 2026. And so there were learnings that we took away from that. And it was a very successful trial. And we, we're now taking those learnings and applying that to the larger collection system that we will use. The other reason, of course, was so we could study the environmental impacts of what we were doing. So we had a, uh, the hidden gem was at sea, it had 125 people on it. That's where the collector was uh, out there driving around on the seafloor. We drove around about 80 kilometers. We uh, collected about 5,000 tons. We brought home about 3,000 tons. And tremendous learnings were taken away from that. But we had a second vessel with about 80 people on it, many of them scientists. And they were there to really study and observe the impacts whilst we were doing all of this. So we did a complete survey of the area. Uh, before we started the trials, we, while we were collecting nodules, we had up to 50 assets in the water that were measuring everything from, from sound to the sediment uh, disturbance and how far it traveled, both in the uh, benthic area on the seafloor and the pelagic area in the midstream water column. And so it's all of those learnings that we're now assimilating and putting into our application that will go before the regulator by the end of this year. So just so we understand the process, the you 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 take advantage of a essentially a vacuum process to suck up these nodules from the ocean floor, uh, retrieve the nodules and then return the sediment to the ocean floor. That 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 Yeah, so we, Yeah, well what two things. We have two sediment streams. One of them is um, one that literally comes out the back of a back of our collector, <clears throat> a little bit like if you were harvesting a paddock of wheat, if you've ever seen one of those um, harvesters, uh, they'll take in the feed at the front end, they'll separate the, the grains of wheat, and then the chaff will come out the back. And for us, that chaff is sediment, and we try and leave as much of it as we can on the seafloor. And of course, one of the great learnings from our collector trial was that that sediment stays very localized. There were rumors spread by uh, some of our opponents that that sediment will travel for thousands of kilometers or large distances. But instead, we found that it stays very, very local. And then the second sediment, um, some goes up the vertical transport system because we use water as the transport mechanism. So there is a little bit of sediment. So when the, when the water uh, reaches the boat, we put the nodules into a, uh, one of the, the hold tanks, and then there's a return water uh, stream. And we haven't decided exactly where that will um, be returned. Um, it could be at 2,000 meters below sea level. It could be 1,500 meters. The results will be driven by the, the data that we collected. But once again, we were very successful in being able to monitor that return water is a very small fraction of that sediment that is there. But we found that it moved to background level, you know, within a couple of hundred meters to the extent we were not able to measure it at that point. So um, I'm, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything new when I, I say that more than a few scientists have said in essence that we don't know what we don't know, that the, um, that the majority of the ocean's floor remains unmapped and that there well may be literally thousands, perhaps even millions of, of species of delicate life forms of which we know virtually nothing about um, that could potentially be affected by what by what you're proposing to do. So um, and and I and these same scientists have have said that there's no such thing as as low impact undersea mining, that the area that uh, 
that your company has taken out mining leases on the, in the, the Clipperton uh, zone is, if, if I understand it correctly, encompasses something on the order of 2.3 million square miles, which is comparable to the, the size of the continental United States. I mean, how do you respond to concerns about the, the potential eco, the, the ecosystem impacts of, of what you're proposing to do? The, 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 the notion that there is a lot down there that we simply don't know about. You alluded earlier to the, um, the minimal, your, your, your conclusion of, as to the minimal uh, uh, amount of life forms down there. But can you say definitively that what you're proposing to do would not affect the ecosystem in demonstrable ways? Mm. Well, that's where data and scientific evidence has to, to lead the discussion. And so if I go back to some of those statements by scientists, their, I guess their, their position was really driven by the fact that they don't have full information. They don't have the data that's necessary to be able to make these decisions. And of course, what we have been doing over the last decade is gathering that data. And so, you know, I think if you look at most of the commentary around this industry, it's, it hasn't been driven on data. It's been driven on desktop studies or, or in some cases, just wild speculation. And there's no better example than the plume. The plume is the, you know, the sediment that we disturb. And, and think of it as, you know, if you drive your car down a dirt track, you'll pick, you'll kick up some dust. The question is, how far will that dust travel and how much dust will there be? And as I said earlier, there was speculation that this sediment could travel for thousands of kilometers. But instead, what we found, which was 100 percent aligned with what MIT found when they were also observing a collector trial the year before, was that the sediment only rises about two meters above the seafloor. Now, keep in mind, we are operating at 4,200 meters below sea level. So the sediment creates its own turbidity current and only rises a couple of meters above the seafloor and up to 98% of it settles again in the same area. And so this is real data. You know, this is data that has been collected uh, by independent scientists who are observing our trials. And, you know, and I think the other, the other encouraging thing when it comes to, you know, those results was we went back out to inspect the area. In fact, our boat returned only in February because the regulator said, we'd really like to see the recovery rates, what's happening to the area where you impacted. And so for two months, we were, we were at sea. Uh, on a boat filled with scientists so we could go back to those exact same areas and study what recovery looked like. And we're going to be releasing a lot of data around that because recovery was just fascinating. You know, we found that there were organisms, um, these fauna organisms that were like within meters of our collector track. So they were in the areas that were most heavily impacted through sediment. Because I, as I mentioned, it stays localized, but if the collector is driving down a track, you could, you could assume one meter a jar, you know, you're gonna find some sediment. And that was what it looked like because we took extensive survey immediately after our collector trials. But when we went back a year later, those organisms were thriving. They were, and, and the other great thing was that the, the sediment on many of the nodules had disappeared. And so nodules that were not visible when we immediately went and inspected after our collector trial were visible 12 months later. And so the notion that this is a, an environment that has never been impacted or doesn't change, we're proving to be incorrect, but you can only get to that truth when you have independent scientific evidence. And of course, if you look at who our scientific evidence is being managed by, it's through world leading organizations. It's the National Oceanography Center. It's the Natural History Museum. It's 
Florida State University, Texas A&M, it's University of Hawaii. These are organizations that have dedicated their, their lives and their long history to solving scientific um, challenges when it comes to this part of the ocean environment. So we are contributing enormously to the amount of available scientific evidence so we can make these decisions. But let me go back to a couple of other points that you raised on that question, Dave. And, and one of them was um, that much of the seafloor is unmapped. When it comes to the CCZ, the clarion clipperton zone, it's about 4,500 square kilometers in size. Sorry, I'm going metric on you. About 2 million of that, so just under half, has been set aside into protected areas. So areas where no nodules will be collected. And if we go back to you know, how you protect biodiversity, it's by uh, setting aside areas, you know, making sure that you don't have any unique ecosystems. So how common are the organisms around you know, a larger footprint? And then making sure you set aside areas uh, for protection. And then about 1.3 million square kilometres is currently under exploration. So much more area is protected than is currently under exploration. And, and in our own case, you know, there will also be large areas that we will leave set aside. But the important thing is recovery rates are much, much higher than people anticipated. And so, you know, that's very, very encouraging. Um, I, I think it's important for us to understand um, the, the, you know, the debate over the, the environmental impacts aside, why, why is this endeavor important? Uh, I know that uh, obviously your company is in the business of, of making a profit, but um, beyond that, the, the, more, the more profound potentials, why, why is it so important that we extract these, these uh, nodules from the, uh, from the deep sea bed? Well, the world has unified around the fact that we need to move away from fossil fuels. We need to address global warming because the biggest risk to our ocean is rising temperatures, acidification of our oceans. And to do that, we're going to need to be driving lots of electric cars. We're going to need to be building lots of renewable power supplies. We're going to need to be building storage for home. We're going to need to be building electric trucks and trains and boats and planes. And that's going to take billions of tons of metals. And in fact, if you go back to a reliable source of data, which is the International Energy Agency, but the World Bank is pretty consistent with these numbers, they estimate that by 2040, mining activities or extractive industries will need to increase by between five and 600% per annum. So the question is, where are they going to come from? And then you have other demand drivers like the ongoing industrialization of the developing world. If it ain't grown, it is mined. And we're pushing into these more and more fragile ecosystems like our tropical rainforest to get these metals where indigenous communities live. And they're not being asked, hey, do you mind if we just pop in here and destroy your home and dig up your backyard so we can go mining for, for these metals that we need for EVs? They're just being pushed out. And so I think to, we have to go back a step. We have to go back to first principles and say, Surely we should be finding the supply of these materials that come with the lightest planetary and human impact. And that's where we should be getting our future metal supply from. And that means being a little bit adventurous about thinking, well, where, where should that be? You know, 70% of our planet is covered by ocean, yet none of our metals are coming from that ocean. Yet all of our people live on land, that 30%. And so I think we have to go to new frontiers. We have to be prepared to, to take a step back and think, you know, we need to be rethinking where these materials are coming from. And, and for me, it's a really clear case and the evidence is all pointing to it. It's polymetallic nodules. You know, there are no communities that live nearby. We're a thousand miles away from the nearest human. And there are no trees to cut down because there is zero flora and the amount of life there 
is measured in grams per square meter. Uh, environmental studies show that the impacts can be kept very localized. And our studies also show that the areas recover much faster than anyone anticipated. So this is all good news. Where, where currently are we mining these, these minerals? Well, that, that's the sad part. Most people don't think about it. We go and buy an electric car, we buy our smartphone, and we just don't want to think about what the true impact of the metals that are contained in them uh, have taken on our planet or humans. And, you know, if you look at the supply of nickel, nickel is a key ingredient to make batteries, but it's also a key ingredient to make stainless steel and many other uh, substances that we depend on. And if you look at 100% of the growth in nickel volumes over the last uh, five years, 100% has come from what we refer to as rainforest nickel. And that means you've got to remove the rainforest to get access to the metal bearing ore. You've got to remove the topsoil to get access to the metal bearing ore. So there's an enormous amount of impact. There are some land-based mines that have low impact, you know, and I think you can't bundle everything into the same basket. It's a little bit like our opponents like to bundle, bundle ocean metals into the same basket because there are seafloor massive sulfides, which are like these chimneys. There are cobalt crusts, which are like these expansive sort of layers of uh, mineral rich material that but they're both attached to the seafloor. So to get them out, you've really got to go mining. And they're also in much shallower waters and there's much more biodiversity uh, attached. Whereas nodules are in this very unique ecosystem, the abyssal plain, and there's no competing alternative uses for that area. And so it's a, it's a special use case. And, and that's the same on land. There are some mines that operate very responsibly but there are others less so. So I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that I understand. So if we're talking about manganese, cobalt, nickel, the ingredients of lithium ion batteries, where, where are you, and you talked about the rainforest, where specifically are we talking about the, the, the geographic origins of these minerals? If I'm Tesla and I'm reliant on, on battery components, um, where am I getting my raw materials to, to manufacture those batteries? Where specifically? Well, about 50% of the market is now coming from Indonesia, the Philippines, and New Caledonia. About 10% of the market comes from uh, Norilsk, which is in Russia. And then the rest is scattered amongst producers in all of the other countries around the world, like Brazil, Australia, Canada. And, um, but primarily, the growth is all coming out of those countries I, I mentioned, the former. Russia, Indonesia, the Philippines, and New Caledonia. So, if the if um, if if your if undersea efforts became a, a viability and, and came to fruition, would would those efforts essentially end the 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 excavation, the the mining excavation of of these minerals around the world? Mm. Well. What they can do is slow down the growth because we're still on a very strong growth, upward growth trajectory. And it's going to be hard to close down an operating mine that's already permitted and is in place. But what I'm absolutely confident we can do is slow down the growth into new mining areas. And in some cases, you know, with the help of consumer and uh, customer pressure, we might be able to stop some of those more uh, controversial areas as well. So, for example, I, I didn't mention the Congo, but so much copper and so much uh, cobalt comes out of the Congo. And we've all seen those horrible images of artisanal mines where children are, I think they, they estimate there's about 50,000 children that mine those artisanal mines every day. And the images are horrible. And so I think consumers and consumer facing brands can play a really important role in saying we need to measure the impact. We need to make sure there are no conflict metals in there. We need to measure 
that there's no child labor being involved. We need to measure that how much CO2 was generated, how much sequestered carbon was impacted by tearing down the trees and digging up the soil. And I think as we move forward, we're going to see more and more of these um, measuring yardsticks. For example, we have a blockchain initiative, you know, which we've been working on for some time. So we can measure those impacts very, very accurately. And I think that the battery passport initiatives or carbon equalization measures that governments are starting to uh, enforce. And by 2026, some of those will really start to bite. You're going to have to own up to this. You're going to have to be really clear on where those materials came from and how you, how you uh, sit on all of those measures. And I think that's another way that metals coming from our polymetallic nodules are going to be a standout choice compared to the alternatives. And so, you know, your question started about, well, where do these metals come from? And, you know, what are the impacts? Well, I think what we need to do is to encourage people to think about those impacts. So the, because sorry, um, the, there's a lot of buzz uh, in the, um, in the, in the world of technology as it relates to the, the, the prospects of solid state batteries. Um, and, and the, the idea that they would, their use would, would supersede ultimately um, lithium ion batteries. Um, that, 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 that these batteries, solid state batteries are, are constructed of more easily derived materials like polymers and, and, uh, and ceramics. Um, do, do, do you have any concerns that, that, that your, your endeavor that will, would ultimately be eclipsed in essence by, by the advancement of technology? Mm. Solid state batteries pose no threat to uh, the raw materials that go into them. In our case, nickel and, um, and certainly the demand for copper, you know, that is certainly increasing. And, you know, and of course, there are other demand drivers that are starting to come into effect now, and that is AI and the amount of data centers we will need and the energy we will need to, to keep those data centers operating. That's really going to, you know, focus on raw material supply once again. But I think that um, when it comes to, and I do hear that argument, people say, yeah, but there are now these batteries that don't use nickel, for example. It's like, good, we need that because this transition has only just began. Like if you were to say that we needed nickel in all of the batteries we're going to need in the future, then there's no way in the world there's enough metals, even if we take all of our nodules and all of our land base. So we need innovation when it comes to battery tech. And so, and we, we count on that as well. So for example, today, uh, batteries that are known as LFP um, have taken high market share, like around 40%. But of course, the, that at that same time, the growth in nickel has gone up 30%. <laughs> the demand for nickel has gone up 30% in that same time. And so this is such an expanding market that we're going to need innovation. We're going to need new technologies. We're, we're going to need alternative technologies to make this transition achievable. And so, and let's go back to LFP for a moment, um, because I spent a lot of time in battery factories, uh, making sure that we're across, where are technologies moving? You know, are there any things we need to be very mindful of? Because, you know, if we came up with a battery that didn't need metals, and I hear people say, you know, that's, that's, that's what we should be going for. It's like, well, I'm not sure how that's going to happen. But anyway, if we did, fantastic. I would be the first to celebrate that. I would be the first to celebrate that because that would be a good thing for our planet. But it's not feasible. Like there's no way that's ever going to happen. And if you look at LFP, it's likely to be superseded within the next decade by sodium-based chemistries because they won't need lithium. And lithium, even though the price has dropped somewhat in the last couple of years, it's still an expensive raw material. But those sodium-based chemistries also depend on nickel. So a part of the market where we're seeing no demand might be replaced by a new chemistry that all of a sudden creates new demand for nickel. 
doesn't use lithium, but will use nickel in the, in the battery cathode. So I don't think you can get away from the fact that we're going to need billions of tons of more of these metals. Like, and, and don't listen to Greenpeace about that. Listen to the International Energy Agency or listen to the World Bank, where they have hundreds of people who are focused on you know, these numbers and better understanding you know, what demand drivers will be and how all of that comes together as a set of numbers. And then looking at the supply side, you know, I think McKinsey put out a report recently that said we need 500 new mines, you know, to meet the, the demands by 2050. Do you know how hard it is to find and build and permit and finance a new mine? <laughs> like, it's really, really hard. And North America is a classic case in the USA. You know, you've got some massive deposits there, but they've had their permits, environmental permits rescinded because no one wants a mine in their backyard. End of story. That's that. There is some truth to that. Um, so, realistically speaking, how long a lifespan do you envision? If that's that's probably an, an, an elegant description of it. How long do you think the the the, the idea of of uh, extracting and exploiting nodules from the seabed will uh, will work? How, how long in your business models do you project earning a profit from this process? Mm. Well, our first application that we will lodge later this year um, on the Nori D site, will have about a 23 year plan, 23 years to take the nodules off there. But of course we have much, much more area. And so, you know, we believe in circularity. We believe that eventually recycled materials will start feeding some of the demand for these battery metals. But unfortunately today, it's just not there. And the reason for that is that there's not enough metal, metals in circulation. And then you go and put all of these new demand drivers like building new batteries and building new infrastructure. And so the recycled materials are not there. And also these batteries are lasting a bit longer than people first anticipated, or they've been put to other uses, for example, in the home. And so they're not coming back into the recycled um, supply stocks. And you only need to look at some of the companies that went public on the thesis of recycling, and they haven't done well because they can't get hold of the material. And so we believe in circularity eventually. And I hope that in decades to come, we will not be collecting polymetallic nodules because there'll be enough new materials in the system and there'll be a sufficient focus on recycling. We'll recycle everything more efficiently and more thoroughly than we do today. So I can't put a time on it, but I hope it's somewhere between 40 and 70 years that we'll be out of this industry and we'll, then we'll be in the recycling business. How did you get into this business? Well, originally I, I learned about ocean metals way back in 2001 when I, uh, a friend of mine went to work for a, a, a company that was active in the space. And he said, um, he told me about it and I expressed fascination and excitement. He said, and by the way, we need some money. <laughs> so I was like, ah, okay, well, I'll, I'll happily invest some money. And so I started to invest in a company in 2001. And, and that really opened me up to the fact that there were lots of ocean metals in our available. And, um, but it was in 2011 that we started this company. And, and, and it had a singular focus. The singular focus was polymetallic nodules. And, um, and that business I invested in in 2001, which is still going by the way, but it was focused on something else. It was focused on seafloor massive sulfides. And so I, you know, I learned that when it comes to ocean metals, there's only one game in town and in my opinion, um, and that is nodules. And so, um, yeah, 2001, 2011, we kicked off uh, the business. We, it was known as Deep Green back then. We changed the name in 2021 to the metals company. And um, yeah, it's been a been a hell of a ride ever since. So um, 
I, I very much appreciate you taking the time. This has been uh, very fascinating. Um, I guess my last question would be uh, posed with the notion of your response to two very disparate audiences, one being your prospective investors and one being the scientific community. What would you say to, to, to each or to both uh, as to whether this, this notion of, of pulling nodules from the ocean floor is a, is a good idea? Mm. Well, let me address the scientific community first. And, um, you know, you're right to be cautious. You know, I, I myself, um, have always considered myself a environmentalist. And I thought when I became chairman and CEO of this company that I, the first thing I would do is sit down with the environmental community and we'd, we'd agree what was important to each other and we'd work together on this. And, and in fact, I, um, within months of becoming chairman, I hired a, a chief ocean scientist to the board, uh, someone who was previously the chief scientist at Conservation International, uh, Dr. Greg Stone. And, and I said, Greg, I need you to come and I'd like you to come and sit on the board. And your job is really simple, protect the ocean and make sure we stay in the guardrails. And, um, and that was at the time people said, are you crazy? Like you're letting an environmentalist come onto your board. It's like, of course that we have to embrace. I was astounded at how little the scientific community wanted to interact with us. And I think Greg was as well. And so, you know, what I would say to that community now is, is please engage with us, you know, look carefully at the scientific data that is becoming available, that we're making available. And, and, and as for your investors, have an open mind, you know, have an open mind to the fact that, you know, if we're not doing this, then we're doing something else. And that is we're pushing into these, you know, important ecosystems on land because we, we can't just say no to ocean metals and not have a, an alternative because doing what we're doing today is wrong. And to investors, I'd say, you know, when do you get the chance to be part of a new industry like this? You know, once upon a time, there was no oil and gas that came from offshore. And then within the blink of an eye, 30% of oil and gas now comes offshore, from offshore. And so the same will happen when it comes to ocean metals. But, but the difference with ocean metals is there's only one area where it is most prospective right now, and that's the clarion clipperton zone and some areas around it, down to the Cook Islands and, and so on. Whereas in offshore oil and gas, you've got the North Sea, you've got the Bass Strait down the Strait, you've got the Gulf of Mexico. There are many, many, in fact, many of the continental shelves have these hydrocarbons. But when it comes to ocean metals, there is one area and we are the leaders in that space. We think we have certainly the best ground and we hope we'll be in production by 2026. And I hope that's going to lead to it being a fantastic investment and a really exciting journey to be part of. Gerard, thank you. It's been uh, fascinating. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it too. Thank you, Dave and Gerard, for a really interesting conversation. We appreciate both of you for taking the time to be here and share your story with us. And thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us today at the St. Helena Forum. As you know by now, this was the first in a three-part series of interviews on the subject of deep sea mining. The next presentation will be with oceanographer Dr. Lisa Levin. I can't think of anyone more capable and qualified than Dr. Levin to bring us up to speed on the science without the spin behind ecosystems that lie in the depths of the clarion Clipperton zone. All three interviews are available now at shforum.org, so feel free to binge or watch them independently, but just make sure that you remember to watch all three eventually to get the whole story. And now, as we say goodbye, I would like to thank the following people for their generosity in making the St. Helena Forum and its continuing programs possible. Mm -hmm.